I were, in my case, it was the discovery of the work of the Frankfurt School in the mid uh, and early 1970s, the work of Habermas and Arendt that rendered this older vocabulary from uh, Lenin onwards uh, to me like an old chant that I knew but which no longer meant anything to me. Their critiques of Soviet-style totalitarianism destroyed any illusions and hopes I may have had for this first worker's paradise. Our anti-authoritarian and radical democratic struggles in the anti-war, anti-imperialist and women's movements could not be encompassed by the language of the hegemony of a Euro-communist party. Admittedly, they say in the preface that they were talking also within the context of Euro-communism. With the rise of the Green Movement in Germany in the late 1970s, where I studied for over 10 years, I found my politics to be in that space to the left of German social democracy, sometimes with the Greens and sometimes against them, but as part of what was called the Ausser Parlamentarische Opposition, the uh, opposition outside parliament. This is why it amazes me, in all honesty, that in, in 1985, a few years after the Solidarność movement had started, four years before the fall of the Berlin Wall, and nearly two decades after the emergence of the women's movement with that pat on the head by Perry Anderson, is reported to have given to Gail Rubin at a New Life Review meeting that the truth chapters of this book are still trying to break the umbilical cord to some version of orthodox Marxism. Wasn't this too little too late? Clearly, the crowning achievement of the book is the powerful theoretical chapter three which announces a new paradigm beyond the positivity of the social antagonism and hegemony. Reviving even that old name of Hegelian studies, Trendelenburg, this chapter turns on the full blast of discourse theory to displace any remnants of an unmediated naturalistic logic in the Marxist understanding of the social. Uh, let me remind you of the definition of articulation and discourse, where articulation is any practice establishing a relation among elements such that their identity is modified as a result of the articulatory practice, and the structure totality resulting from this practice is called discourse. This is page 105 in the new edition. A non-Hegelian but decentered totality in which elements do not simply become moments that are aufgehoben, Rather, the tension between the elements and the moments becomes crucial. These are moments when the fact that the social is not sutured, that it is not uh, a completely consistent totality comes to the fore. And this word suture is one of the words that is repeated again and again in this crucial chapter. In fact, um, um, uh, Mouffe and Laclau's commitment to discourse theory is so all the way down. In a passage that I find pa fascinating, they criticize Foucault for making distinctions between institutions, techniques, productive organizations, and discourses, and they say, but no, neither institutions nor techniques can be identified outside of discourses. Of course, everything is linguistically mediated, but is discourse really all the way down? These theoretical promise, premises lead toward the crucial category through which also hegemony itself will be reconceptualized in the book, namely uh, antagonisms defined as the ultimate character of this unfixity the ultimate precariousness of all difference will thus show itself in relations of total equivalence where the differential positivity of all firms is dissolved." End of the quote. This is the formula uh, of antagonism which establishes itself as the limit of the social. Now there is something profoundly attractive about this because it is a demystification of all uh, naturally given, historically frozen relations of uh, power. But at the same time, there is also something deeply troubling to me about this particular uh, chapter. This is not social theory, let alone critical social theory. It is a hyper-idealism of discursivity, which eliminates all historical differentiation and does not permit us to talk about institutions versus discursive articulations, social action orientations versus systemic and unintended consequences of social action. This chapter gives us an ontology of the social, and I would even say an metaphysics of the social, but not a critical theory of the uh, social. The concept of the articulation, very, the concept of articulation, very much carries with it still the revolutionary romanticism of that epiphantic moment of confrontation from Sorel to Benjamin, and of course to Carl Schmitt, who later on assumes a more prominent role in Chantal's work. Now, given this theoretical edifice constructed in chapter three, it was surprising to, see, to me as a reader now, re-reader, 
the rather down-to-earth analysis of the new social movements in Chapter 4, in the light of various kinds of theories prevalent at the time, resistance to commodification, industrialization, homogenization, certainly all of which are, are uh, plausible. But what really disturbed me then in the final chapter is the understanding of democracy. And in a book you know, committed to demystifying all sorts of articulations and false totalizations, democracy was simply defined as the pluralization of political space, their maximum autonomization. And in terms borrowed from de Tocqueville and Lefort, democracy was defined as the transformations of the logic of equivalence into the production of the social. Again, this remains at the level of ontology. There is nothing about democracy as a practice, as an institution, as a habitus. Uh, some vague gestures are made towards participatory and representative democracy, but there is no theory of democratic legitimacy, public sphere, official and unofficial public spheres, interaction of power and legitimacy at the nexus of society and the economy, and no analysis of the administrative state apparatus. Now, one book cannot do everything, and I don't mean it in this way. I'm trying to point out to a theoretical issue. I'm just trying to say that in a book that is so hypercritical in its chapter three, this invocation of democracy truly uh, uh, puzzled me. Now, in the, this is my last point. In the preface to the 2000 edition of the book, uh, the authors point out and uh, to this uh, lack of articulation of the concept of democracy and, and attempt to differentiate their position from interest group pluralism on the one hand and from deliberative democracy on the other. Now, since the latter about deliberative democracy is a disagreement which goes back to more than 20 years that I have had in fact in particular with Chantal, let me say that I will still insist that deliberative democracy does not presuppose a theory of the general will or consensus. It is not Rousseauian mystification. We are all more intelligent than that. Rather, it is a critical theory of democracy where we use the principle of generalizability and transformation of interests in terms of a critical model for asking the question who participates or in your language, who has the subject position what are the topics of the agenda? Who sets the rules of the agenda? In fact, deliberative democracy is a process of democratization and democracy as process. So I just want to conclude saying that increasingly it seems to me important maybe to go back to something that John Dewey used to say, to understand democracy not simply as majority rule, not as pluralization of the spaces of the political which need to be carefully articulated from interest group politics and in this book, you don't do it, and we, it is a collective effort, and we are all invited to do it. But we do we to understand democracy as experiments in living, as the application of the collective intelligence of human beings to their lives together, particularly today at a moment in this country when the institutions are totally uh, frozen, and there is a need to unblock institutions and maybe reimagine institutions of the 18th century, which now today hamper rather than uh, further uh, democracy. Uh, we need maybe you know, to go back and rearticulate this uh, crucial uh, uh, concept. And I want to conclude by saying that it has been a pleasure to re-engage uh, with this book. Uh, our uh, disagreement has not, have not ended, and I look forward to continuing them. Thank you. Well, I'm uh, going to take you in the uh, opposite direction of where we've just gone, and I'm uh, afraid it's going to be a bit of a strange ride. I hope you keep your mind open. A lot has happened in the 25 years since Hegemony and Socialist Strategy was first published. This fact, A, makes the enduring power of this book all the more extraordinary, and B, is obviated in part by the admirable persistence rare in our era of hy hyperspeed distraction and bandwagon chasing of Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouffe, who have continuously returned to their original arguments in order to buttress or uh, re-elaborate them in ways that answer to theoretical criticisms and emerging political realities. It is nevertheless a plain fact 
that when hegemony and socialist strategy was first published, the Berlin Wall and the Twin Towers were still standing, and the, men, and the enemy against which, which democracies defined themselves was communism rather than, as now, Islamic fanaticism. Time will tell what impact the emergence of a neo-jihadist offensive will ultimately have on the political form and concept of democracy, or what lessons will be learned from the democratic populist incubator that is Iran. It is clear, however, that the event of September 11 will have to begin to challenge our conception of democracy in a profound way. I propose to take up this challenge here via an oblique route by choosing to frame my brief remarks in terms of Shiite or Islamic philosophy, um, which I began reading only after and because of that event, which erupted in New York on an election day Tuesday. The terrorist attack not only interrupted the voting process that highlights the differences a democracy is ideally supposed to preserve, but very quickly established a link among people across the globe. What we need is, is some way to account for this phenomenon of social contagion, whereby disparate people experience themselves as belonging to the same world. Henry Corbin, the influential philosopher and Iran, uh, Iranologist, frequently reiterated the following distinction. While Western philosophy is a philosophy of abstraction, Islamic philosophy, the strain of Shiite mysticism which still influences political thought in Islam today, even if it is often twisted to suit an incom incompatible agenda, is a philosophy of illumination. I would like to use this distinction to discuss one of the most important invention, interventions of hegemony and socialist strategy and the subsequent work of its individual authors, the reintroduction of a concept of the universal into political thought. That I propose to look to Islamic philosophy to illuminate the concept of universality will rightly strike you as strange. Widely denounced, denounced in recent years as an Ur concept of Western thought and justifiably associated with Western imperialism, the concept did not have much of a fan base in 1985 among Western critics of the West, to say nothing of Eastern critics eager to detoxify the world of Western ideas. The pendulum had begun to swing in the opposite direction. The talk of particularity, of multiplicity, of disaggregation had started to phase out the tick of universality or oneness. The problem, of course, is that the tick and the talk together describe the arc of a refusal to think the very possibility of, how to put it, a oneness that would be superior to unity, which is the very thing Laclau and Mouffe were after. The concept of the universal is a prime example of what Corbin had in mind when he set himself against Western philosophy's procedure of abstraction. Starting from particular objects or persons, abstraction airbrushes out features deemed con contingent until it arrives at those it considers essential to the class of things or persons it subsumes, those features that identify what the members of the class share. The critical notions here are subsume and share. Subsume says that that which is universal comprehends or engulfs the particular things that fall under or within it. <clears throat> this point is capital. The grouped persons fall within the universal. The latter does not fall within them. The universal is a bloodless thing, a product of the intellect with no physical reality, no reality in individual persons. As Marx once quipped, one never encounters a universal man in the flesh, only uh, individual men and women. It was even this relation of subsumption that permitted the would-be radicals of the talk phase to dismiss the universal so incredibly easily. While purporting to define what was essential, the universal itself began to strike them as inessential, as a nominalist fiction appended by the intellect to things that could function very well without it. In fact, these critics had their finger on something. The universal leaves particularities exactly as it finds them, untouched. It does not attempt to describe nor account for the phenomenon of sharing. 
but merely notes the recurrence of shared features as any decent filing system would do. But what can sharing mean here when it is so, well, abstract? Sharing in this abstract sense in this abstract sense is more properly understood as the equivalent of the platonic notion of participation. It posits a vertical relation between the individuals and the uni universal or essence. No horizontal relation among the individuals enters the pictures and they enters the picture and they thus remain closed in on themselves. The reaction against the separation of the abstract universal from concrete individuals eventually led to the nominalist mantra, there are no universals, only individual things. A mantra that was meant to rock the world, but felt far short of this, since its gesture of frugality was not matched by any attempt to formulate an alternative to the sclerotic form of the universal. That a that an alter alternative is necessary was precisely the argument put forward by Leclau and Mouffe. Some notion of the universal is needed. If one wants to understand the phenomena of political or group formation of any kind, the lateral relations among individuals. Do not miss the point. To insist in the mid um, 80s climate that there are not only individual persons, but also groups social and political formations was to avow that groups were not just nominalist fictions, but real. There is not only individual existence, there is shared existence as well. And if the concept of the abstract universal was insufficient to account for this, another one had to be invented. This invention took place in the work of Leclau and Mouffe via a reference to an emptiness or absent fullness of the social which had been neglected by the adherents of particularism. If you do not remember, you can still readily imagine the response of their critics. Those who had legitimately complained that they had never encountered a universal man now complained that they had never encountered an emptiness in the flesh. Oh, but they had. They just needed to be shown how to recognize it. Um, and if I had long, longer, I would argue um, uh, that this emptiness um, is also the flesh of the social, uh, which is a notion uh, which one can found in Claude Lafour, um, although it's undeveloped there. I leave this point behind, um, however, to return to the smaller circle of my argument. The mistake of the critics opposed to this idea of the emptiness of the social was their assumption that it was attained through abstraction, through a process of emptying out or purging particular features until an empty universal was arrived at. In his response to one critic, Laclau lucidly points out this mistake, insisting that his notion of emptiness should be assimilated not to an operation of abstraction, but rather to the mystical intuition wherein God, as far as he is radically ineffable, is an absolutely empty fullness as far as conceptual de determinations are concerned. He is beyond any conceptual content. Here we have an emptiness which is not submitted to any formal rule and which does not result from any process of abstraction. Now, it is this mystical intuition which Islamic philosophy illuminated in an exemplary way. <clears throat> Do not be alarmed by this reference to God. The intention is not to turn the discussion toward theology, but to grasp the radical dimension of monotheism, which set aside poly polytheism, not by simply reducing the number of gods, but by introducing a new notion of the one, of a one God, who would be the God of everyone. This one God was not arrived at by eliminating the particular and clearly human features of the polytheistic deities, which would have simply turned the one into that which absorbs all the old deities and all the created into itself. It was conceived rather as a limitlessness um, or infinity out of which everything emerged. Several points of distinction follow from this. While the abstract universal opposes itself to the particularities it, is, it subsumes, the apophatic or featureless one is the ground and impetus of the individuals who come out of it 
come out of or exit from it. Creation ex nihilo means precisely this. Individuation is the act of emerging out of the one, which is not an, uh, an absence, but a surplus of presence that is an unpresentable presence. That individuals emerge from an apophatic one assures us that they have no relation of resemblance to that which they, from which they come, that they are related not on an imaginary or symbolic, but on the level of the real. A potential difficulty arises if we continue to think of this one as transcending the in individuals who emerge from it. Um, since Leclau and Mouffe have always maintained that the universal they want to pursue theoretically appears on the same level as individual reality. There is no conflict here with the one of the Muslim myth mystics who do not place the one above the individual but insist instead instead that it precedes what comes from that it precedes what comes from it the priority of the one cannot however be defined by chronology or abstract time it indicates rather that an individual comes to be what it was or discovers itself um, or